Vyasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So I've already said it once, and I'll probably say it again, but it's really uh, uh, delightful to be here with everybody in person, breathing together in the same place, um, emphasis on the same place. Um, so yeah, I'm coming from California, um, just arrived on Wednesday, and yeah, spent about two or three weeks at my home monastery where I ordained uh, a Bayagiri monastery in Redwood Valley, California, Northern California. And it was just a really lovely time reconnecting with my preceptor, uh, Lumpur Pasano, who will be visiting us at the end of the month, reconnecting with my uh, brother and you know, brothers uh, in the monastery, uh, both the monks and the postulants in different levels, reconnecting with the land. It's a beautiful piece of 280 acres or so of really pristine uh, forest land. Um, so just a very uh, heartwarming time there. And I got to reconnect with a monk uh, who I knew from Thailand named Kruba Gai or Ajahn Gai. Uh, he'll be coming with Ajahn Pasano at the end of the month, so people who come for that will be able to meet him too but just a really sweet monk, a really sweet monk. And so raised in Thailand, this is his first time. He just came to Abayagiri uh, maybe a month or two before I saw him uh, earlier this month. And he's been speaking and practicing English since a very early age. His English is great. Um, but yeah, this is his first time actually in an English-speaking country. And uh, I was surprised when I was in the Tara's vestry, that's Tara means like the elders, and that's elder by years in robes. So if you've been in robes for 10 years, you're an elder, and was in the Tara's vestry, and he came up to me and told me that he had a joke. And uh, I, was, I was happy, I was happy to hear that, and was wondering how it was gonna go, because it's not easy to tell a joke in another language. So he said, uh, his voice is somewhat low, he says, Ajahn Kovilo, I was I'm a little bit, well, he first asked permission, can I tell you a joke? And I said, yes, that would be great. And he said, I'm a little bit worried about Ajahn, Ko Ajahn Nisibo up in Seattle in a non-Buddhist country going for alms at Pike Place Fish Market. And I said, uh, why is that? And he said, because they sell fish. Yeah, and that was my reaction. First, it was just, I was just awestruck and <laughs> saw empty space. Just, I, I was, I didn't know what to think. I just worked on so many levels and uh, was so impressed. Um, but it's a good thing to, to reflect on. And um, it's something which, uh, this, this theme of being, being unselfish or being selfish and what, is being created up here in, in Seattle. And uh, I, I've got a somewhat unique view of this. Um, you know, many of you come every week. Uh, I know, I think I know most people here, most people by name even, um, not everybody, um, and hopefully be able to meet the people who I don't yet know. But if you're coming every week, um, it's like, yeah, you see your uh, cousin or your niece or nephew just grow up and you see them every week and you don't, you're not, surprised um, by how they grow. But if you come and see them every year or every six months, uh, there are these like leaps and bounds in the growth that you see. And that's what I've been kind of permitted to see when I've been coming up here just for winter and summer breaks. And uh, yeah, just see a, a vibrancy and a real health, uh, healthiness and robustness to the Clear Mountain community that's being, um, yeah, co-created by, by everyone here. Um, 
And it's really beautiful and just reflecting on why, why that is. And I think part of it is this, uh, yeah, the unselfishness that people are bringing to the, the practice. And it brought to mind uh, six qualities which the Buddha talked about. He talked about them in different ways. Uh, there are certain suttas where he refers to these six qualities as the six qualities that lead to non-decline or lead to growth in any group, whether that's the Sangha or uh, when he's teaching these uh, group of people, the Lichavis, who were a confederacy of, you know, somewhat of a democratic confederacy at his, uh, in the time of the Buddha. Um, and he was teaching them this, uh, this teaching on uh, group harmony and group growth. And as long as they or us in the Sangha or as a group of practitioners, any group that practices these six principles will lead to non-decline, will lead to growth. The Buddha also talked about them elsewhere as being what he calls saraniya dhammas, or the dhammas, the qualities, the teachings, which are saraniya, or to be remembered, that's one translation, or principles of cordiality, principles of cordiality, or the principles of endearingness. Um, and yeah, it's something which I really see. Uh, there's something endearing, something really sweet about the Clear Mountain community, which is, is definitely not the flavor of many Dharma groups. Um, yeah, I think most every Dharma group that I've ever sat with has its own strength, and many Dharma groups, their, their strength is in formal meditation. So you get together, and you might not even know the names of the other people in the group, uh, but you sit together, and it's quiet, and yeah, you get together every day, or every week, or every month, or once a year for a 10-day retreat, and there's a lot of sitting that goes on, and there's strength in that. But the type of saraniya dhammas that um, hopefully, and it seems we're just cultivating uh, as a community, uh, really make for this, um, yeah, there's a, a softness, a sweetness, something which is to be, uh, to be remembered and recollected and made, made conscious, um, which leads to growth and non-decline. And to help us remember these, I wrote a poem and... Uh, I brought all my second grade poetry skills to this, so hopefully you'll be able to memorize it. It is a rhyming triplet. So, these are the sweet teachings that lead to non-decline. Loving kindness by body, speech, and mind. Giving virtue and views of noble kind. So that's six. So you've got loving kindness by body, speech, and mind, giving virtue and views of noble kind, views of noble kind. So that's the six. And thought to maybe focus on uh, the, last, the last three of those, so the giving virtue and views of, of noble kind, and then maybe circle back around to the um, aspects of loving kindness by body, speech, and mind. And all of these, uh, the Buddha says, are virtues which uh, to be um, when, to lead to this kind of sweetness and this um, coherency of community uh, are practiced both in private and in public. So public and in private. So these are things which we do not just when we're together, but things which we can practice even when we're separate from one another. And uh, that leads to an openness of, of community. So that fourth quality of giving, of, of generosity, um, it's just something which, um, yeah, having there be a monastic element to this, this community, this parissa. Uh, parissa is the word that the Buddha used to talk about the fourfold assembly. Uh, parissa is the assembly. You've got uh, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and uh, lay men, lay women. So basically a cohesive monastic lay uh, grouping which supports one another and when you bring monastics to the picture whether it's Ajahn Nisibo and I on a regular basis or our uh, venerable sisters in robes uh, other venerable friends who we invite on a regular basis we don't use money um, we don't keep food so we're, we're reliant uh, for our general sustenance, our everyday food, we come in for alms uh, every day, and that makes us uh, reliant on the other people. We uh, m intentionally make ourselves vulnerable in this way. And then, yeah, 
people, if it's going to happen, kind of step up. And every day um, so far, we've gotten enough food to sustain us through the day. Uh, we've been able to have enough transportation to get us to our alms round and back. Um, this morning, and when you make yourself vulnerable like this, you see really beautiful things and you get to hear about other ways that other people step up in this, uh, in this way and it becomes quite inspiring. And I've said this before, whatever people might think about a monastic way of life, um, yeah, in America, Protestant work ethic, there might be the view, who are these beggars with no job who are basically, you know, mooching or, you know, they don't have any, uh, what are they contributing to society? They just beg for food. Um, whatever you might think in that vein about the monastics, the people who offer us food, offer us support, offer us a place to stay, that is just pure beauty. There's just, um, yeah, a brightness and we get to see it every day as the recipients of that. Um, there's something which changes in the heart when you're just a constant recipient of other people's gratitude on the receiving end of that. That just opens your heart to uh, humanity and friendliness and the possibilities and uh, you just see beauty every single day again and again and again. Just this morning, the ferry basically broke down and that this is my first time coming by myself, um, basically, um, here in Seattle and I, I didn't know what I was gonna do. So they say, We'd already gotten on the ferry and they say, oh, ferry's broken, everybody's gonna have to get off. And I was getting off and just happened to walk out with this uh, person who started up a conversation and they ended up driving me all the way around uh, <laughs> and bringing me up here. And then Jason uh, met him in Fauntleroy and got here. So this is a person I'd never met before, uh, but had a fantastic, really eye-opening conversation and uh, yeah, part of ways I gave them a brochure. They weren't Buddhist, but um, yeah, just had a, that was a great way to start the morning. I didn't expect to experience the emotions of gratitude and warmth uh, that I'd be experiencing as I did this morning. So uh, just something which uh, this necessity of, of generosity kind of thrusts upon um, the monastics and gives the opportunity for anyone who's in the position, yeah, that you don't, if you don't have these uh, precepts if you're in a, a lay position and can support the monastics in this way. Uh, you get to see others. Um, you get to offer food, whether it's here, on a, whenever you're able to come. You can see the, the beauty of it and it creates this, um, this gift economy. You see this totally different way of, of living. You're able to participate in a, an economy which is so different from just the, the tit for tat, the give and get economy. It's like this person who gave me the ride, they have no idea if they're ever gonna see me again. Um, and yeah, so what do they get from giving me this ride? Um, what do all of you get from offering me rice in the morning, offering us um, something to eat every day? Um, and yeah, you get, you get what you get and you can look and feel that, that warmth of heart and uh, the immediate kind of good feeling that gets from being able to let go all of these uh, latter three, eat all of these bases for cordiality, these things which are to be remembered are framed in terms of being liberating virtues. So giver giving has a liberatory aspect to it. There's an aspect of when you're able to, okay, let go, let go of the apple into the monk's bowl, let go of whatever it is that you're, you earned the money to give this thing and then you let go of it. There's a, a literal letting, letting go. This is one meaning of chaga, which is sometimes translated as generosity, but which is also a synonym, another name for nibbana. So this chaga runs all the way through from any form of just letting go, giving into any kind of recipient's uh, bowl, stomach, mouth, into the full giving, the full giving up of liberation. Um, so we have this opportunity and uh, you can see it in communities like this that uh, kind of step up and we do this in public and in private. So one thing which I would love to hear um, in 15 minutes or so, we'll be opening it up to anybody who has questions or comments, would love to hear from you um, how you make giving a part of your, your life, if you can make it a part of your daily life, whether you do that already or if you're inspired now to create a new habit, uh, that's a great thing to do. 
any kind of giving, whether it's to the Sangha or to this broader community or to any, uh, any group that you're inspired by. The Buddha said, if beings knew, as I know, the fruit and result of giving, they wouldn't eat before having made an offering. And in Sri Lanka, Ajahn Nisibo and I have mentioned this before, there's a practice called the Saraniya practice. And Saraniya here is the same word, this to be remembered, this quality of cordiality. The Saraniya practice is before monks will eat, they go through their alms round, get their food, but before they eat, they go around and put some of their food in another monk's bowl. And it becomes quite beautiful. I remember the first time that I was just a postulant and a monk uh, gave me a chocolate bar that had uh, some a couple pieces missing. And uh, at first I was like, this, what a eaten chocolate? And you're gonna give me some eaten chocolate? And uh, it was a little bit, come on, monk, you know, like, you know, you know, raise your game a little bit, you know, give me a full chocolate bar. But uh, having been on the opposite end of that, we don't have that much to give, actually, we don't have money. So sometimes we have half-eaten chocolate bars. And even that, the Buddha further said in a different sutta, uh, even giving the rice grains that are left in your bowl, pouring those out into a pond where there are beings with the thought, may the beings in this pond uh, feed off of this, this food. So when you have finished your food for the day, any kind of scraps you have left, just putting in the compost or even in the trash if you have to, just may, some being is going to eat that because there are so many uh, beings, so many animals. Um, and even that is virtue, not to say even that is of great fruit and great benefit, not to mention giving to a human. So we can practice that and would love to hear how all of you um, practice generosity and can make it more a part of your life and like to make it more a part of your life. The second aspect of uh, the fifth type of Saraniya Dhamma, and I'll say that great poem again so you can all can memorize it. It's loving kindness by body, speech, and mind, giving virtue and views of noble kind, views of noble kind. So virtue, uh, keeping the five precepts. Um, in some secular Buddhist practices, this aspect of virtue or precepts or sila just isn't really a thing. Uh, people aren't really interested in that. You can see the benefits of meditation, lots of different uh, studies about the benefits of, the medical benefits of doing meditation. It lowers your blood pressure, et cetera. Um, but yeah, some people just might not be interested in keeping precepts or that aspect of Buddhist practice. But coming to a group like this and seeing other people do it, again, no pressure if anybody is not yet, um, yet doesn't yet see a benefit to um, how precepts or these different life trainings uh, might be an aspect which could be a great support for your meditation, how that, how that dynamic works. But if you're starting to see that or you see it in others, um, yeah, you can see the, the worthwhileness of it, how it makes you become more reliable to yourself. You can trust yourself more when you've got these principles, when you've got this sense of integrity that I'm not going to break these. And you become, uh, the Buddha said, it's a, a great gift to the world when I don't kill. So that's the first precept. When I don't steal, when I don't do sexual misconduct, when I don't lie, when I don't take intoxicants, I'm giving a great gift to all beings because they don't have to fear me. They don't have to fear that I'm going to kill them or steal them, steal from them or... Uh, do sexual misconduct or lie or take intoxicants and thus be more prone to break any of those other ones. Um, yeah, there's this, okay, I'm around this person who keeps these and I'm safe to that extent. They might be awkward or whatever, but at least I'm, I'm safe to this extent and I can you know, rest assured um, that they're not going to hurt me. Um, so you can see that. You come to a group like this and it feels, it feels safe. You can let your, your guard down. Um, in a sense, and we do these in private and in public, and you see the benefit of that, and you get a sense for the power and the gravitas, the uh, solidity of a person who keeps the precepts. Uh, just, I'll speak for myself, living with my teachers who've been keeping precepts for Ajahn Pasa, my, my teacher, has been in robes for over 50 years, been keeping the monastic precepts for that long. And I've lived very, very closely with him. I've lived in the next room. I've 
probably possibly slept in the same room as him, you know, been in contact with him in all sorts of difficult situations and just seeing his integrity in many, many different situations. And um, yeah, most of us, we don't know each other that well yet, but you do get a sense that, okay, these people are not just keeping the precepts when we're together, but they're keeping this. This is something important to them that they keep all the time. They're trying to keep all the time. They're training in these all the time. And it leads to a sense of, uh, yeah, I can, um, I can trust this person and I can trust people. Um, so seeing if you can do that in yourself because you see the solidity that that can bring. And that solidity of precepts can lead to a solidity of meditation. So in our ordination, whether it's for bhikkhus or bhikkhunis, for monks or nuns, uh, part of the ordination chant is when you practice sila, then your samadhi is of great fruit and great benefit. So when you practice precepts, when you keep, have a, an ethical system, uh, principles that you keep to all the time, then it makes your samadhi, your meditation, your concentration that much more grounded. You're grounded in body and you can become more easily grounded in mind. And when your samadhi is grounded, then your wisdom can lead to great fruit and great benefit. So this virtue, concentration, wisdom, there's a feedback loop between all of these. They all help and support one another. And that leads to the uh, final of these six Saraniya Dhammas, uh, which is uh, views of noble kind. So the word for noble here is Arya, and this is the same word for the noble truths. These are the Arya uh, Suchas, and it's the um, word for the noble beings, people who, in a Theravada context, uh, there is a view uh, that it is possible to abandon unwholesome states, and it is possible to cultivate wholesome states. So very fundamental uh, faith, belief in, in Theravada Buddhism, it is possible to abandon unwholesome, the unwholesome states of mind, it is possible to cultivate wholesome states of mind. Basic, uh, basic view um, that, yeah, you can't force yourself and nobody else can force you to believe anything, but that's a pretty fundamental, positive, optimistic view to have, to take on. It is possible for me to train my mind. Something else which is added on top of that, uh, the, the noble liberative views, which, um, yeah, when you come to a, uh, a monastery, for sure, uh, which is a place where to be able to ordain, we've already been living together for at least two and a half years before you're able to take the full precepts. And there's this uh, coherency of views, coherency of views, you know, who's to say, if anyone at any of our monasteries is uh, an enlightened being, but there's extreme sincerity. Um, everybody in these monasteries are just super sincere people. And I can say the same for the people who I know to the extent that I know you here, just very sincere people. And part of that is a similarity of view. Like even if, you know, we all get angry and annoyed and irritated because we're not yet enlightened, but there is this view that I, I do want to abandon anger. I, I see, I value non-anger more than I value uh, my own belief that you've wronged me in a certain way. And certainly in a safe environment like a monastery, you can do that. I can abandon my own anger and because I see the value in that. And all of us, even though we're all our own squiggly lines of you know, heading in a, a similar directions and um, our own views differ in the particulars, but that's an overarching view which we share with one another. And so, yeah, it seems like this is, you know, Ajahnisibo and I, and when we have visiting uh, friends kind of share their thoughts, this is something that we all share, this, this view that uh, it is possible to abandon unwholesome states of mind. And anger and craving are unwholesome states of mind that it is possible to abandon. And we're all talking about that in the same way. Um, there are other groups which are great at meditation, and you can come together and meditate together, but where there isn't this coherency of views. And yeah, you sit together, but then when you talk together in the kitchen, you know, on the retreat or whatever, you hear their views and like, oh, that's uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I don't know uh, 
what do I think about that? And you kind of just, uh, okay, that's nice. And you kind of change the subject. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you can, there's a broad consensus of, uh, of views about things. And you know, one level of views, which is part of what's called mundane right view, is that there are beings, there are practitioners through who, through their own efforts, have realized the truth of awakening, who have realized the path for themselves. So this is a view. This is a view. You either believe it or you don't, or you've just never thought about it. Like, is it possible for someone to completely cleanse the heart, transcend greed, anger, and delusion? Is that even possible? Most Americans, you never thought about it. Or if the question comes up, then say, oh, of course not. No, it's just like, yeah, it's a human thing. You know, we're all like greedy and we're all angry and that's just like, that's the way we are. And uh, um, yeah, no, you, <laughs> you can't abandon that. You can't get rid of it. We're, we're human, you know, we got this body. And uh, there's a level of greed and anger that's built in there. But uh, reading texts like this, meeting people who have been working at this and uh, trying to, uh, you know, smooth out these wrinkles in their own personalities, their own mind streams for decades and decades. Um, you see, oh, maybe that is possible. This person certainly seems to have less irritation. They're less, Thai word, you know, these great Thai words, which mean like less just irritable or uh, uncomfortable, anxious around people. They're just worked out their psychological wrinkles to an extent. And you think, oh, if they can do it, maybe I can do it. And then maybe you even meet people who seem like they have, you've lived, you live close with them and you see them and they just seem to have a, a radiance about their being, which I can't know. I don't know if uh, the teachers that I've had uh, are enlightened, but I do believe in this becomes, it's a level of belief. I do believe that I've met people who have to some level gotten rid of greed, anger, and delusion in their own hearts. And that's a belief, and that's a view, and that's something which we can talk about, and again, not trying to force anybody. Um, just talking about uh, views yesterday with someone, and um, yeah, there's this saying in Pali Buddhism from the suttas, which is, yene yene hi manyanti tatotang hoti anyatati. Whatever way one conceives it, the truth is ever other than that. So um, <laughs> you have to have a sense of humility about these things. Whatever way one conceives it, the truth is ever other than that. And yeah, there's also a belief about rebirth, about, um, yeah, that there are past lives and maybe future lives. And uh, that's harder to, to swallow. That's harder to get one's mind around for many Westerners. And uh, yeah, just walk very softly into that. And the Buddha did talk about it and say that it could be a useful view to, um, yeah, consider, a useful view to consider. So considering that, if the mind is open, of course, no pressure, and really it won't affect uh, our views about you. I mean, it, that's not the forefront either. Um, there's so much to appreciate about each other here, and that's when we have these uh, you know, just say the poem one last time, because in addition to being a cool poem, it is a memory aid. So, in any of you who've memorized it already, I've said it twice, and if you've memorized it, feel free to say it at the same time as me. That'll be cool. But here we go. I'll say the last, the second, the two, second, third of the triplet. So, loving kindness of body, speech, and mind, giving virtue and views of noble kind. All right, there was at least some murmuring that was going on at the same time there. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can all just seeing that those things are valuable and seeing the extent to which they exist in other people here. And, uh, yeah, it leads to just a brightness of community, a softness, and a sweetness. That's another translation of Saraniya Dhammas, these six things which uh, are just, they're sweet, like Ajankai. So, uh, maybe leave the talk there and... Uh, open things up to questions or thoughts from people. Hum tamayang tamakata satu karang katama se satu 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 anu.
Okay, and this would be a time too, if anybody wants to stand up or change postures, you're welcome. And um, if we had a mic runner, um, someone who could bring the mic to people, uh, if anyone has a thought or a question, either uh, in person or on Zoom, um, you can just raise your hand and uh, we'll bring the mic to you. And if people could say their name too, that would be great. Yes. Uh, since you mentioned f food and chocolate, I was wondering if, um, if in this philosophy there is a, a list of foods that would be considered to be the best in terms of uh, the, the things that you can reach maximum? That's a great topic uh, for like a whole week retreat. Um, What's fascinating is that uh, the Buddha wasn't more explicit about that. Um, yeah, the Buddha says that he tried before he um, attained enlightenment. Uh, he knew other ascetics and he himself had certain views that of the path of liberation through diet, that it was possible through honing one's diet to be able to attain liberation that way. And that's certainly a, a big modern thing which is boosted by the health food industry and, and whatnot. But um, yeah, is there a place for being aware and conscious of what you're eating, how much you're eating, and the effect that has on your mind? For sure. There's a sutta called Sevitabha A Sevitabha Sutta, maybe Majjhima Nikaya number 17 or something, 8, 16, uh, which is to be cultivated, not to be cultivated. And the Buddha talks about all sorts of things which are to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And he says, there are foods which are to be cultivated and not to be cultivated. And he doesn't then, in uh, elaborating that, say, oh, you shouldn't eat foods X, Y, Z. You should only eat macrobiotic, organic, et cetera. Um, you know, he says, uh, you should cultivate, you should lean into those foods when you eat them, that they lead to the increase of wholesome mental states and decrease unwholesome mental states. And you should lean away from and not consume, not eat those foods which lead to an increase of unwholesome mental states and a decrease of wholesome mental states. And that would go both for uh, qual quality of food, choice of food, and quantity of food. So that's a, a long answer, but you have to figure out for yourself because different people have uh, that's different for everybody. Um, bread might be a staple. Uh, yeah, wholesome, uh, well-cooked wheat might be a fundamental part of many people's diet, which leads to the increase of wholesome mental states. And for other people, it just leads to lethargy and torpor. So, yeah, figuring out for yourself. Hello. Yeah, I was just at a Gary, and um, just the giving there is very profound. And uh, it was so nice seeing Ajahn Kovalo in his natural habitat. <laughs> um, the hardest thing for me to give is uh, I give my mom cigarettes all the time. Um, but she loves giving too, so maybe that's the fuel she needs. <laughs> wow. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my natural habit habitat, and I'm uncaged down there. So. Yeah, no, there is a, yeah, this freedom when you're, a bunch of other people are dressed like this, and it's totally normal, and um, that's great. Um, and it was great seeing you, too, there, Kirk. And, uh, yeah, no, this is a, a big question. Um, and I've known other people who are Buddhist and whose family members yeah, just aren't, I, I have a very close, um, someone who I really admire, uh, a laywoman who is looking after her father who has dementia. And yeah, she's doing amazing work on the level of generosity and service to her father, which is amazing, which is fantastic. But he, after a lifetime of, uh, you know, drinking every day at happy hour, that 
you know, he hasn't forgotten that that's part of what he does every day. So, um, yeah, she, this is a big question for her as well. And I think it'll be up to each individual and the person that they're, um, yeah, working with, with a family member or, or friend, uh, what, what works. Because obviously, I mean, on, a, on one level you are, um, yeah, working on a level of, of generosity and cultivating that. Um, but then at the same time, yeah, there are these ethical questions about that. Are you supporting her habit? And um, yeah, my kind of the person, my mentor, um, who's looking after her father, um, yeah, doing the same. And he's old enough that she doesn't feel like she's, the habit is just so ingrained that she doesn't feel like she's, you know, adding too much fuel to the, the addiction. It's just so in there that um, she doesn't know what to do. So I think there, for both of these instances and probably for others, uh, you have to use your, your wisdom, faculty, discernment, because the answer just isn't, it's just not so black and white here. Um, I remember when I was first learning about precepts, this was coming up. It's like, what do I do? Like, how, or how do I even uh, relate to my old friends who are doing all these things, drinking and smoking and whatever that I used to do, um, and they're having a good time. How can I relate to them now? And um, yeah, especially if it's a family member that there is this connection there. That's another aspect of right right view, mundane right view, is that there is mother, there is father. It's stated in a matter-of-fact way like that. But what does that mean? There is mother, there is father. Um, it can be suggested that uh, there is a special, there is some kind of relationship uh, of filiality and relationship between children and their parents. So um, definitely didn't give you a clear answer, but um, just acknowledging that you're, I mean, trying to work with it. And if it was possible to open up a conversation with your parents about that or what my, I'll just call her my mentor does is he has, you know, forgotten, he does have dementia to some degree. So she can like, you know, hide the alcohol and kind of, you know, until he remembers, she can help him not remember if that, if that makes sense. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. Udas? You can unmute yourself, I think. Hello, Bante. Hello, everyone. Uh, Bante, just I would like to share my experience. Can I share, Bante? Yeah, please. Yes, Bante. Bante, um, these days I have been habituated by remembering a precepts while I was waking up. Before opening eyes, just remembering the five precepts. Along with five precepts, I was remembering one more precept, like to be loving and kind to self and all beings. And these six precepts I am remembering daily, and I'm cultivating this as a an habit. And I feel that whenever, if I break even a little precept, like uh, telling a white lie, then I feel a difference in our state of mind. Now, I feel the precepts are the basic foundation of a building. Like without precept, the building cannot hold. Like foundation, if a foundation is not there, the building cannot hold. In a similar way, if the precepts are not uh, maintained, then we cannot maintain our state of mind, which is being experienced. Really, I feel a difference Really, uh, these precepts are like a foundation for of our state of mind, cultivating mind. And I thank everyone. I thank Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha for giving this path in this life and experiencing this state of mind. And I wish all happiness. Thanking you. That's great. Maybe we can do what Ajahn Nispa calls a sparkly sadhu. So sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I've heard other people say that as well. I've experienced that when you wake up or you can go to sleep, this is one of the benefits of loving kindness is that you sleep well and you wake up well and you have good dreams. So, and it certainly helps when you keep precepts and you see that. And you mentioned something which I think is pretty common too. It's almost, it almost at the beginning might feel like a trap, like a sila trap is that the more you start paying attention to your, your actions and keeping precepts, uh, 
the more you start to notice when you break, when you break small ones, and it, it seems like a negative feedback loop, and it's like, oh man, it's just like cursed by the monks. If I had only never heard of the precepts, then <laughs> there wouldn't be this problem. Um, but it, it's true on one level that there is this, you do become more refined to how you're uh, hurting yourself, to the suffering that you're causing yourself and to others, uh, but you also hopefully can at the, at the same time become more sensitive to uh, how to resolve those um, small picayune, small little things. So, yeah, thank you, Gudas. Great to hear that story. Thank you, Bhante. Thanking you all. Thank you. All right. And uh, Matthew? You can unmute. If you still have your hand up, I can't tell. Okay. So Kathy passed on asking a question. Okay, Amy. Hello. I was in a difficult spot, and so I made an aditana to do an act of generosity or dana every day. And it really challenged me. And I quickly was like, I can't give enough gifts every day. And so I got a really good burrito and went back to the cart and was like, thank you. Like, that was amazing. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could speak to like, just giving like time or giving appreciation as an act of Donna. I didn't qu quite know if that was in line with that Adi Tana. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And just for people who aren't uh, familiar, thank you for sharing that. Uh, this word Aditana uh, can mean, can be translated as a vow or a strong determination. And it's in this context, yeah, you make a, a strong determination. I'm going to do X for such and such amount of time, or just, yeah, I vow to yeah, give something every day. Um, and that's very much in line with that Saraniya practice of before I eat, I'm going to give something. And I think you make a great point um, and give a good example of, yeah, if you, if someone lives by themselves and say you don't have kid, if you have kids, then you can always give to them, uh, you know, before you eat, or if you've got a monk in the neighborhood or a nun, then you can give to them. Um, if you've got pets, you can always do that. Um, yeah, or giving to your garden. Um, so just being creative with it, but you make a good point. Even maybe you can't do that. So yeah, being yeah, grateful, um, expressing your gratitude and giving your time. Uh, that's a really smart, uh, a really smart go around. And um, yeah, be curious to how that goes as well. Um, but yeah, thank you for sharing, Sadhu. Hello, everybody. I'm Blake. Uh, I have a, <laughs> an interesting one. That, this kind of what people have been talking about with bringing it up. I have a, I've stopped smoking, and I've been really enjoying that. Um, and I have a bunch of extra lighters. And all of a sudden, people have been asking me for lighters. All, like, and I, and I, I know that it's sort of like, like the, the dementia patient. You're, you're kind of enabling vice a little bit. But in my mind, they're going to be getting a lighter regardless. They're, they're, that's, in, or maybe, I don't know. But uh, it, I have... It's just been leading to a lot of like positive interactions, and I get a, uh, I get to meet strangers and have a. And we typically have a little chat and you get to know people, and I always come away from it feeling a lot better. And uh, so it's a, it's a funny little thing, like just something like that, just like yeah, I'll I'll hold on to my I'll hold on to my lighters and pass them around. I don't know. Hey, right, thank you. Nice, thank you. What was your name again? I'm Blake. Blake. Okay, that's awesome. So if anybody has any lighters you want to give away, Blake is your <laughs> lighter giver. So. Uh, that's fantastic. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And as you mention it, and when you, yeah, live around and in cultures, you know, culture of gift and in gift economies like this, you just see the brightness that it brings in people's hearts every single day or as often as you um, encounter people like that. And it touches on something. All of these points can be talked about as uh, paths to pamoja, pamoja being well-being. So they're these whole... Um, yeah, 
this causality of happiness that the Buddha talked about. It's not just the causality of suffering, how our ignorance brings us suffering, but the Buddha also taught about how being generous, uh, having right views, having uh, keeping precepts can lead to pamoja or well-being, which leads to piti or joy, which leads to tranquility, which leads to happiness, which leads to samadhi. So it's not just um, su yeah, it's not just when I meditate enough, when I have enough samadhi, then I'll be happy. But through practicing all these things we're talking about, that can lead to happiness, which can then be a basis for samadhi itself, for concentration. And you see it, and you can feel it in your own body, this kind of uplift. That's the PT. That's this, yeah, when you're, uh, your hair is going to stick, you know, stick on end because of this, just hearing about what someone is doing, um, which is generous and impressive. So, yeah, sadhu, that's great. I think, can we, maybe we can come back to Shraddha. There was, did you wanna, yeah, please. Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Dominic. Um, I was wondering if you could speak on when an intention for generosity doesn't go the way one has expected. I know that I have, there was a recent experience I've had where I've tried when I've been on walking trails to move small bugs, snails, maybe a worm, so forth, to move them out of the way, and I feel good about myself, I feel good about that. There was a time where I saw a worm on the ground and I picked it up to, to, to move it off, and I realized it was dead, but I still moved it, and underneath, I saw that there were ants that were actually about to take it away or eat it. And it struck me a lot, like, not only did I not help the worm, but I stole the food of the ants. <laughs> And it messed with me pretty badly. And just any uh, things to keep in mind when I'm working with uh, an act of generosity that doesn't go as I had intended. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a theme. Uh, a number of people are bringing that up. And uh, yeah, I think a good thing to keep in mind is when the Buddha and how the Buddha defined uh, karma. So what is karma? Karma is intention. So if your intention is to save the worm, your intention is to help your mother, help your father, um, really foregrounding that intention, and that's really what matters. Um, but also, you know, bringing wisdom and discernment to the whole whole process. Um, you know, there, <laughs> there's that horrible, well, it's not, it's not horrible, there's some insight into it, but the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, yeah. Ajahn Tanisro reframes that in a Buddhist context. The road to Nibbana is paved with skillful intentions. Um, but yeah, bringing both of that, you know, training our intentions, knowing, knowing our intentions, being more aware of what our intentions are, but also training them and becoming smarter and uh, quicker at them. So um, yeah, you've encountered that once and I've been in similar situations and now you'll have that much more information for next time if it happens again. And um, yeah, bringing, yeah, considering it, say like after thinking about your precepts uh, is there's certainly a part of that to, to practice. And uh, yeah, when the mind is calm, maybe after meditation, if this is coming up, just letting that question kind of drop into your, into your meta, the calm mind and seeing what comes up. Yeah, great, Dominic, thank you.